And now, here's the host of the God, Family, and Country radio show, Lance Hoppus. And good evening. Thank you so much once again for tuning in to listening to the God, Family, Country radio show right here on 930 AM, The Answer. You know, folks, if you like what you're hearing on this radio station from the God Family Country Show, remember that you have the power and the influence of 10. That means all your friends and your family members, if you tell them about what you're hearing, share it with them, and then tell them if they want to hear this, they don't have to tune in on Sunday night, like right now, to listen to it, if they don't wish, because the show is podcast. And you can find the podcast programs on 930amtheanswer.com. The shows are all archived. You can go back to the very beginning to find the very first show that we, we produced. There is a reason for this program. It's because it's God's will. God desires that the people of America wake up and understand <clears throat> your heritage. Your heritage doesn't just go back to who your family members are or the forefathers and the founders of this nation. Your heritage goes back to God himself. That's, that's God. Elohim, the Alpha, God, the one that created the sun, the moon, and the stars where they're at. God, the one that created the earth and all that's on it, in it, under it, and around it. God, the one that created the most incredible gift for mankind. The most incredible gift for mankind. He took that gift and gave it to us, sacrificed that gift for you and I. That gift was his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. So if we believe in him, we can have everlasting life. And the purpose of us on planet Earth, located in the United States, is to carry the word of God forward. That is why he picked the United States along with Israel. We have with us today two fantastic speakers, my co-host who always helps me, the incredible Roy White, retired lieutenant colonel, and also he has with us another speaker, Julie DeWolf from Twin Falls, Idaho. Folks, let's see what everybody has to say on the other side of the microphone. Well, thanks, Lance. Thanks for having us today, and thanks for our listeners, those who are listening to us tonight here at Sunday evening uh, here in San Antonio, the Hill Country as well as those who may be watching us live on our webcast that we're uh, broadcasting uh, through Encounter Truth. So we want, want to say thanks to the Encounter Truth folks for putting us online for the live webcast. If you want to get more information on how to get that live webcast so you can actually uh, send in your messages, your questions for our listener or for our speakers as we talk, uh, feel free to write to us at G416Patriots at gmail.com. Again, that's G416Patriots at gmail.com. That's the name of our new organization. Lance, it's G416Patriots, and it stands for Galatians 416. I was just getting ready to ask you, what's that stand for, Roy? Yeah, well, Galatians 416 is the, the verse where Paul has come back and spoken to the Galatians there after his initial visit. And in doing so, there was controversy uh, on his second visit, in his first visit, he was speaking to his Jewish friends. He was Jewish, and he was speaking to his Jewish friends, to saying to them, hey, to become a Christian, you need to listen to what I'm saying about this man, Jesus Christ, who was just uh, put to death here recently. And we need to listen to what I'm telling you about the power of resurrection, the gift of God that he's given us his own son to come back to us and in doing so the jews listened and many of them many new churches began there in galatia well as he left and came back months later the people who had been the leaders of galatia were beginning to hear that he was coming back and they knew that they were going to lose power and they were going to lose influence and so they began a movement to the only people who could be true Christians were Jews. Oh, don't threaten somebody's power. <clears throat> Woo! You know, so they could not comprehend, and they were convinced now by the fellow Galatians that, hey, you could only be a follower 
a true Christian if you were Jewish. You couldn't allow Gentiles. You couldn't allow pagans to become Christians because that doesn't make us exclusive. And if anything, Jesus was all inclusive. And so he ended up coming back. And in Galatians 4.16, he suddenly responds to this negativity that he's getting from all the people there. And he's telling them that you don't have to be Jewish to be a Christian. And they were saying, no, no, no. And why are you saying this? This is really not right, Paul. And Paul was finding this tone and tenor to their disagreements of saying, why am I now your enemy for telling you the truth? I'm telling you the truth. And yet they didn't want to accept it. And we here in San Antonio, we've been talking the truth about Islam. We've been talking the truth about the spiritual battle that's going on between Christianity and Islam. And we must be telling the truth because, quite frankly, people are getting upset about it. And Paul found that when he was telling the truth, Jesus, when he told the truth, the Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't like it. And what do we see here in our communities today? People rising up, Muslims, non-Muslims, many non and Christian leaders who denounce when you say the truth about Islam or about what their agenda is. You begin to find people very upset about that. Well, that doesn't mean the truth is still not the truth. It's not hate speech when you're saying something that's truthful. You're just saying something that people don't like. Well, sorry, take a number. Get in line. That, <laughs> that's, that's not my concern. It's a big line. That, that's right. And, and, and the Bible tells us, you know, you have to speak with love, but you have to speak with truth. And we're not about hating anyone. And when you say these things, you're not saying them in a hateful tone. And I know what we're talking about today is an issue that's very controversial, and that is the refugee resettlement program. And here in San Antonio, we have one of the largest here in Texas. Uh, people may not be aware of, but here in the country, we've received, I was lo just looking at the, the latest statistics in terms of how many refugees we've been accepting here in the United States. And quite frankly, the, the challenge is, is that Trump has not really slowed down the process for the number of refugees resettlements that have been coming here in well, the United States. Well, he's been blocked on every turn. Well, that's true. But we are still, we, they have had some blockage. So when people think that this problem was going to go away, it's not going away. The, the southern border traffic has slowed down oh, immensely. A, absolutely. But the, the shipment of refugees coming that's in. That's exactly the right. The globalization is still continuing. And, and one of the cities that's been at the heart of this is the city where our guest, Julie DeWolf, is with us today from Twin Falls, Idaho. And you think, Hello. Now, why would Twin Falls, Idaho be a target? And, Julie, we want to welcome you here today. We want to give you time to kind of tell your story about Julie is an activist there in Twin Falls. Um, someone who has just taken it upon herself and her team of volunteers to really look deep into local politics and to it's led them on a journey that's taken them around the world as they looked at this globalization that you just mentioned, Lance. So I want to welcome Julie DeWolf to the show. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Roy. I appreciate that. And indeed, your words are true. Well, and <laughs> and have you have gone on a journey once you stepped up. That's right. Well, we're glad to have you today. So tell us a little bit about how the refugee resettlement issue has changed the culture of a city that you've been in since, I think, 1998. And what was Twin Falls, Idaho look like in 1998 versus what it looks like today? When I arrived here from Alaska in 98, Twin Falls was predominantly a Caucasian community with a large percentage of Hispanics, a good percentage of Asian Americans, Indo-Chinese, but otherwise largely a Caucasian community. We have seen the influx of refugees change the demographics, which in and of itself is not a concern to me. I did say I was from Alaska, and Alaska is one of the most demographically diverse areas you can possibly live. That being said, when the refugee program started to steer more specifically to Islamic migration, that started to get people's attention. It wasn't based on the color of skin. 
it was based on ideology, which is something that we all ought to be concerned about, whether it's our neighbor's ideology or someone on the other side of the globe. Absolutely. And, and so, Julie, you found yourself in the middle of this controversy, and what really got it going was in 2016, a young family with a five-year-old special needs child, young little girl from the Peterson family, found themselves in, in a position that no family would ever want to find themselves with. Tell us the story of the Peterson family and what happened to this young little girl. I will. They lived in an apartment complex, a familiar name now to most of us, the Fonbrook Apartments, a lower income but nice community. They were centered very near the College of Southern Idaho and very near the place of employment that the father of this little girl walked to daily because at this time they did not own a vehicle. What happened was on the 2nd of June, their daughter was assaulted. And their daughter was a five-year-old who was prematurely born at around two and a half pounds and since then has not sharp as attack mentally. Her struggles have been physical, as is the case. Right. She nearly up to her grade level because she is a little fighter, let me tell you. But um, it's worth noting, I see a lot of the time people consider that she is handicapped, maybe mentally, and that her story then is somewhat off. Right. That's not accurate. She is very sharp, a very intelligent girl. She's just tiny, tiny, tiny. Her, her frame is very small. She was assaulted. She was five. She had three attackers. They drug her into a laundry room where there was not supposed to be access. The laundry rooms were supposed to be locked when there was not someone using them. And a wonderful elderly woman that everyone called Grandma saw something suspicious, went to the laundry room, and addressed the attackers, who she found to be in the middle of the attack. Everyone had been stripped naked. They were urinating on a little girl and doing things to their own bodies to stimulate themselves. She rescued the little girl who began begging, help me, Grandma, help me, Grandma. She was terrified. Uh, Grandma did deliver her out of that situation. She took control of the boys in the sense that she had them get dressed and she had them stand beside while someone called the police. This was at around 3.30 or 4.30 in the afternoon, according to the eyewitness testimony. The police were called numerous times, and according to the eyewitnesses at the Fondrick Apartments, the police arrived around 6.30 p.m. Well, we have... And what you've not done so far is identify the three young boys. And these were, uh, I believe they were 14, 10, and 7. Is that correct? This is what we are told. There has been no age verification medically on these boys. This is something that is of specific interest to those of us who observe what is going on with uh -huh. refugee resettlement. When someone arrives here... <clears throat> They don't have birth certificates. So we don't necessarily know when they were born. And if we look at UK right now, we see almost ridiculous, hilarious incidents of people taking in youths who end up being in their mid 20s and attending high school or junior high That's right. with UK children. So when we have ages assigned to children without medical proof having been examined by a doctor, we can't know. What we do know is that the 10-year-old was physically capable of something that 10-year-olds typically cannot do. That's what we do know. But again, there has yet to be any age verification on these boys. They have just gone with whatever was slapped on them from the beginning. Well, Jill, we're speaking with Julie DeWolf from Twin Falls, Idaho, who is highlighting an issue that has, you know, appeared there in their city but to think that this is an isolated situation would be totally inaccurate but what brought it to the head was the fact that the refugee resettlement and these three boys are in fact refugees one from Sudan two from Iraq uh, and the response of the local law enforcement officials after this Julie 
tell us about what the local prosecuting uh, district attorney, as well as the mayor, as well as a former Supreme Court justice, a uh, state Supreme Court justice, how and the media. Give us some of that background of what went on from that June incident of last year uh, and what the families, the victims, were victimized again because of, uh, of this incident. Absolutely. This rape occurred on the 2nd. It was the 13th that a group of citizens addressed the city council in a public input time asking questions because this issue had not been addressed. There was no arrests made. On the 20th of June, bam, it all broke loose, and we started being accused, of course, being racist and bigoted and just hating, literally hating. They, they typed the word hating, refugee. The prosecutor immediately started saying, and I'll quote, there, there was no gang rape. It's not true. And he went on to feed the general media with, blanket statements, which led many people, even to this day, to believe this rape has never occurred. He denied that they were Syrians, that it was a gang rape, and that it was at knife point. Let me tell you, the backtrack of this is these children were not Syrian. But because of the local Times News newspaper having printed an article about Syrians using a photograph of African Muslims, this family, the husband and wife, the mother and dad, were confused about what ethnicity violated their child. So going on public information from the Times News, seeing that they were blacks when it was written up about Syrians, that's what they thought. And in fact, it ended up being Sudanese. But that gave this prosecutor and many others the power to say, oh, the accounts are not true, they're not true. When we look back, we can see that the little girl had a cut on her neck. It had been photographed by medical staff at what they call locally the CARES, which is for children at risk. The doctor originally said, yes, it was a cut. Without reexamining the child, two days later, called the parents back and said, oh, it's just a scratch. It's not a cut. The little girl did contend it was at knife point. This was, again, on the second it was the 21st when the police went to look for the knife. And my understanding is the medical records that, uh, because of what was generated out of this, has the family had access to these medical records? No, they have not. At so. this point, uh, the case, of course, has come to an end in the sense that all three boys have admitted guilt, which is somewhat of a relief. But while we were going through this, they couldn't even pull their public 911 records and still have yet to see them. This family was stonewalled everywhere they turned. And it was quite curious because we all know that 911 calls are public. This is not something that you would normally expect people to withhold. During this event, State Representative Lance Clow was able to get his hands on this and write up a big article and send it out to all the legislators in the state. Using details, this family still has not yet seen. And this was condoned by City Councilman Don Hall and by the city attorney, and they wrote up an article saying this happened and this happened, and we, it, it was releasing information by permission, even by permission of the city, to a legislator who had never spoken to this family, and this information was material that the family has yet to see. Okay, Julie, this is Lance. Um, as, as you're listening, folks, you're listening to Julie DeWolf from Twin Falls, Idaho. And, Julie, I have a question for you. I, I, you know, I don't really know if you know the answer to it, but it's, it's a statement and a question. Here's the situation that I'm hearing and I'm hearing about these public officials in Twin Falls, Idaho, that basically are they're committing a cover-up. And the question that arises to me is who and from where does the cover-up get initiated? Who prompts the, the cover-up? Because I can't believe in my mind that these individuals being on the legal side in Twin Falls, Idaho, just automatically say, oh, we need to cover this up. We need to create a cloud of confusion where no one can understand this. 
I think, and Roy will have his commentary about what he believes, but I think it has to come from someplace else. It has to be fed to them, probably like someplace like CARE or the Muslim Brotherhood that's involved somewhere. Well, I think you always follow the money, and I think Jim, uh, we're going to talk in a little bit about that. But, Julie, very quickly, we were coming up to the bottom of the hour. But give the tease of, of how this community could be so influenced uh, to distort the truth and, in fact, have uh, one of the uh, individuals, I believe it was the uh, U.S. attorney for Idaho, who threatened to prosecute Idahoans who spoke out about the crime. Um, right, she did. Exactly. So That's true. Where, where, is sure. the, where is that source of a desire and energy for these local officials to do what Lance and us were just talking about? Well, the specifics of that are still being investigated. It is ongoing by numerous sources. We want to get to the bottom of it as much as anyone else wants us to have resolution here. At this point, we have a lot of ideas. And we can point fingers and say this has something to do with it in this section over here in this section. But we want to make sure that we have absolute proof when we go after these. What we do know is that when f people first started being concerned about Syrians coming into the area, it was within a week that the local newspaper had interviews from all the elected officials who stood in support of the refugee center. Every one of them. There was no dissenting voice. We see the same thing on the city council. No dissenting voice, seven opinions, and they agree in perfect harmony, which immediately looks suspicious. When you have 20 residents standing up saying, don't do this or don't do that because of whatever their personal experience and reason is, and the city council still votes unanimously to support whatever has been presented mm -hmm. on behalf of the refugee program, you can't help but wonder what's behind it. Mm -hmm. well, and we have quotes from... Stephen Harkin, who's a representative, and he said it's a very small group of people who appear to be motivated by the hatred of others. Mm -mm. Right. Is well, it, this is their attitude. Yeah. Julie, we're going to come take a break here at the bottom of the hour. Lance, we've got Julie DeWolf on the line with us talking about the refugee resettlement program and the issues of silencing people in Idaho, as well as um, the implications of what that means here in Texas. We're going to talk about some numbers here in Texas and bring it back here locally and because there there is a huge issue we haven't had an incident like this occur but it's just a, a symptom of what's happening around the country so julie thank you so much for being with us we'll be right back here at the bottom of the hour lance folks we're getting ready to take a break at the bottom of the hour for a short news brief get that straight lance news break, <laughs> news break. there you go <laughs> don't go away we're gonna be right back and we're back my goodness gracious, folks, this is the God Family Country Show on 930 AM, The Answer. And this program is also podcast, so you can pick it up at any time you wish. And listen to it, or just simply go to 930amtheanswer.com. We have uh, Julie DeWolf on the line with us from Twin Falls, Idaho, talking about a case that we've all heard. And Roy White's sitting here with me. I want to point out, before I turn it loose again, that we have nothing, absolutely nothing, in the world, in our heart, but love for the Muslim people. Have no reason to have any other different feeling. It's Islam that scares us. But, I, you know, I, I, I don't care if you're Muslim. I, I don't care what you wear, how you dress. You know, um, be nice to me, I'll be nice to you. It's all in Jesus Christ that I try to look at how in the world it is that I address the world of Muslims. It's a controversial situation. It's a situation that's problematic because it's been made problematic by many people. I'm not even going to choose a line to say this side or that side made it a problem. But I'm going to say this. If you're a Christian and you truly believe in the love of Jesus Christ and our Father, those of us who have been accepted by Jesus Christ as his children, our Father is God, his children, we've been adopted into his kingdom, it's incumbent upon us to love our brothers and sisters and to pray for them. And everybody on this planet <clears throat> is your brother and sister. Even that crazy little guy running around over there in Korea, you know, um, you got to pray for him, man. Got to pray for him. 
there's an ultimate answer, you know, if they get wacko and go the wrong direction. But it's still our responsibility to pray for them, that they find the love of Jesus, and they find the love of God, the desire of God for them to be in their kingdom without blowing themselves up and killing other people. That's not the way. The way is the way through love and through peace, not strapping on bombs. Absolutely. We have the power of the truth of just speaking the truth. That's the most powerful, and that's what our, our guest has been doing and, and really raising this awareness. So we're, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Lance. I, I think we have to understand the power of our words. The Bible gives us that, and, and protecting uh, not only just loving, but protecting what we do have. Well, you know, Roy and Julie, it's a problem because there's a lot of negativity with the topic, oh. with the subject. And the problem t is that it's, an, again, incumbent on us as the Christian to keep the positive in the direction of Christ and the love of Christ for all people. A absolutely. And, I, and I, having met Julie and, and talked to her, you know, we all love our families. We all love our communities. That's why we do what we do. The great, you know, many, many of the folks who are being abused are other refugees who are being in, you know, improperly labeled as this or that and we're not doing that at all and i know julie's not doing that at all but what we have to look at is the underlying ideology as julie said at the very beginning of what we're having and and one of those uh people who have been on the forefront is phil haney phil haney will be coming here to san antonio to speak he on, is so incredible on, so cool on monday may the 15th at village parkway baptist church at 6 p.m phil haney author of see something say nothing a Department of Homeland Security, one of the founding members of that, who was a whistleblower uh, and exposed what was going on behind the scenes and still continues to do that, will be speaking here in San Antonio. And that's at 6 p.m. at on May the 15th at Village Parkway Baptist Church. They can write to us at g416patriots at gmail.com to get more information. Again, g416s for Galatians 416. Patriots, plural, at gmail.com. Write to us. We'll make sure you get the invitation, and we will look forward to having a, a big turnout to show Phil. He'll be doing a book signing there of his book, as well as be speaking about uh, the San Bernardino shooters that occurred out in uh, California, as well as the Orlando shooters. Both of those were from a group called Tablikli Jamaat that he was familiar with and had been tracking, and that data had been deleted out of the Department of Homeland Security records uh, and as he says and he firmly believes that if that had not been done if they had continued following his his lead where they had been uh, working on uh, those were two terrorists and he was responsible for removing 300 300 arrests of potential terrorists 300 Zarnaf brothers were two Mateen out in California were two he f he helped bring 300 off the streets that's incredible so we're gonna have him speak here so I hope we have a large turnout come on out and hear him we'll be talking about uh, more about that coming up but we have another warrior and another Patriot with us today Julie DeWolf up in Twin Falls Idaho Julie we we talked earlier or in the previous half hour about what some of the underlying changes in your community have come about and and a lot of it in a lot of communities here in Amarillo is the same way is it's about money. It's about corporations, about globalism. And you have a large corporation that has made its home there in uh, Twin Falls uh, that is uh, a huge advocate for refugee resettlement. Tell us a little bit about those connections and, and, and why that's important for our listeners to understand. Yes, that is true. We do have the Chobani yogurt plant, which I believe is the largest yogurt plant <laughs> at least in the United States, it probably is. in the world. It's massive. And the CEO of it is a Turkish Kurdish man named Hamdi Yulakaya, who, with the Clinton Initiative, is strongly devoted to bringing refugees into the United States. He has the wherewithal because he is a billionaire and also he does sit on the Federal Reserve Board, even though he is not a U.S. citizen. That Amazing. Has changed it. Say yeah, that. Say it that is. again for our listeners. He sits on the New York Federal Reserve Federal Board. Federal Reserve Board, as a non-American, 
and he runs this company as a non-American, which is noteworthy. If we want genuine investment into our country, we have to be as Trump is and consider what's best for the United States, what's best for the people. Um, when I am going through all of this, to me the real hero of this story is the attorney Mark Dury, and he is the one that represented this little girl and her family in court. It took me months to find an attorney when I was searching originally back last summer no one would take this case. So we here we have a teeny tiny blonde five-year-old who was raped, gang raped by refugees. And the very fact that her violators were refugees made it a hands-off thing. Nobody wanted to touch it. So I wanted to give a shout out to Mark Gurry because of the fact that he was the one individual who said, I'll step up. I'm going to go toe to toe. And in fact, he has had personal attacks from elected officials, from the prosecutor's department, because of the fact that he stood up to defend this teeny tiny American girl. Well, as, as we, and, and there are some heroes in this, and obviously the family has suffered greatly besides the physical impact uh, to the young girl, uh, but to the family itself, the intimidation factor. Let's talk about how the Muslim community responded to this there in the refugee community to their family and to others as you described to me some of the intimidation that was uh, laid upon you and others for bringing this topic up intimidation occurred almost immediately when this became public this family suffered having their home um, kind of become a drive-by amusement if you will many of the times it was groups of young Muslim males who would just stop out in front of their home. They had their home attacked by firecrackers. So they had suffered an enormous amount of fear because of the aggression that they experienced. We've seen that we've had numerous general public suffering in the sense that we've had people spit on, we've had people followed. Um, threatened, yelled at, and that just goes on. That's a that's an average, everyday occurrence that you can find a local Idahoan suffering something like that because of the refugee that has whatever issue. Uh, this family also suffered slander by Councilman Greg Lanting last year when he said on his Facebook page that there was no penetration at this rape and that there the situation was a lie. The child does not live with her father. The police are now, the courts have the video, so the father couldn't have seen the video. Um, and the father was uninvolved with the child. There's no way he saw the video. And this is from an elected sitting councilman speaking on Facebook about his family. So they had, on the local level, they had people driving by their home and, and kind of making them out like they're a television show all the way up elected officials speaking comfortably these types of things against this family. They have not been embraced, they have not been protected, and they have not been looked out for by this community. Well, I have a question. The um, question I have is, let's back this up a little bit to that yogurt plant up there. How many of their personnel are refugees versus just regular citizenry there in the Idaho, that Twin Falls, Idaho area. Right. We have been told that it's about 300 of their employees or somewhere around there, depending on how many people they have employed. It, it, it's one of their closely guarded secrets. They simply do not give access publicly to who they hire and who they fire. But when you research deeply, and this would include interviews with people who do work there and have worked there, the turnover rate is astronomical. When a refugee is hired, he works for the period of time that his labor is subsidized and then he's released. I myself have met innumerable refugees who used to work for Chobani and no longer do. So there is something going on there where it's a conveyor belt, if you will. The new refugee comes into town, he gets his stint at Chobani, he gets let go, he gets to go on to the dairy industry or okay, one of the let, cheese let, factories. Let, let, let's hold on a minute here. Let's back something up to a word that you said a moment ago, to where their their labor, this particular, Subsi is subsidized. subsidized. <clears throat> what do you mean by that? 
Well, what it is is a percentage of the cost or their their um, check that they take home is subsidized by tax dollars, by federal tax dollars, which you and I pay. And that's a so great that that's a great deal. Of, that's a great deal for Chibani. It is. Yeah. Why would that be? And and why would we be subsidizing? And, and, and let, let's also uh, address the fact that Chibani, because of their relationship with the Clinton. There's a $12 billion lunch program that the FDA and Department of Education work in conjunction with. You know who's the biggest, who has the biggest contract for yogurt with, the, with this program, Lance? It's Chobani Yogurt. Is that not correct? It was correct, but it, two days ago, it appears that Trump has struck that deal down. Wonderful. So, God willing, we will see that change, and that definitely will upset Chobani's industry here because he is not a diversified industry. <clears throat> he makes one product, and that's yogurt. It what the so yogurt was going into the schools? Have, oh yes, it was all part of the pro, lunch, yes. school lunch program. What nationwide or oh, nationwide? It was a twelve million, twelve billion dollar program because of his relationship with the Clinton Global Initiative, and and his connections, fundraising. I mean, you don't get on to to the New York Federal Reserve Board and not have a lot of connections places. His donations, yes. his lobbying. Um, Chuck Schumer, his yeah. New York. Because their first off, their first factory was in New York. He wasn't stupid. Yes. And Schumer was a was a big fan of his. So here you have someone who had a pipeline to, and, and this is a, you know, and, and in some ways it's a wonderful story about a young Turkish man who comes here to America to establish his business, but he knew right away, very quickly, you know, how to take advantage and $800,000, and, and small business loans are great, but he took that 800000 business loan and has turned that into, again, a successful story, but how you use that success in bringing in others. No, it's not a successful story if he's doing it off of my tax well, dollar because, you know, amen. I bust my hump every month to get my taxes done. And and me and those boys are always talking all the time. That's right. So, so but, yes, yeah, so uh, you, you're really, you are seeing the effect, the effectiveness. And certainly the local leaders there, they all bow down. I mean, if he calls them, they're going to answer. Well, yeah. praise God for President Donald J. Trump. <laughs> Well, that that is good news. I did not that's have. Right. I didn't have that last. He's week. my man all the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's only a two-day news, so it certainly is Go not get him, out Donald. in the general public yet. And we have not seen its impact locally. We just have that he did strike that, and we are waiting to see how that impacts. But it's noteworthy to say, in addition to what Chobani has done to change the demographics of Twin Falls, that Greek yogurt, the way that it is processed, it has a lot more waste, which they call that. And that waste is trucked to various sites throughout southern Idaho and dumped. That is considered toxic. If it gets in a waterway, it absolutely destroys life. And we have a volcanic rock base in Idaho, which is a very porous kind of rock. Yet we have enormous gas ponds, which look like a yellow crusted septic situation. It stinks like septic. And they're dumping and dumping and dumping and dumping. No one will address that issue. So here we have a foreigner with a giant yogurt plant polluting Idaho. No one cares. How can the waste from yogurt be toxic? There's something wrong because with that Because of picture. the fat content in it and the processing. Yeah, and but we're fat talking, content should be natural. We're talking 12,000 gallons in one truck. We're not talking some little bit of amount. Uh, that's okay. Going on. That's okay, Julie. I don't care how many gallons are in there. That's If it's fat, it should be natural. There's something else going on in it that's that's the problem. Yeah. Well, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you know, well, it, it's well, like oil is a natural process. Oil really doesn't do a lot of contamination except for in the beginning. It makes a mess. But it's natural. It all washes out in the oceans and stuff. There's something else going on with that fat up there. They got something else going on. There, there's, a, there's a monkey with that banana up there. Well, Julie, one, and our, th we're talking to Julie DeWolf, <laughs> Twin Falls activist, who has been bringing to uh, our audience and to people there in Twin Falls a lot of information about the refugee resettlement program, about the corruption that's gone on within the, the local community there, uh, highlighting some of the relationships, uh, nefarious relationships between businesses and 
uh, the local government and how they've tried to cover up a sexual assault from a young young girl there the, uh, from the Peterson family. And, and we're just we're very pleased to have her on the air today. Julie, as you uh, went through this process, you told and when we sat down and talked, you talked about some of the you talked a little bit about the intimidation factors but in the drive-by, but you described to me one scenario about people at work who were actually being intimidated uh, of people coming into their shops, uh, taking photographs. Talk, talk to us a little bit about those people who've had the boldness and the courage to stand up and talk, uh, what's happened That's with right. them. We've had a uh, local researcher, more than one individual, but I'll speak of this one, who has done some investigative work on behalf of all of us, and she is frequently followed. She and her her spouse have been photographed on more than one occasion by someone who does identify themselves as a Muslim. Uh, vehicles taking pictures of license plates, following um, in and out of stores without making purchases. Very bizarre behavior that's gone on. And as she is investigating these things, this type of behavior is increasing. It, the police officers locally are very disinterested in her calls for assistance as it regards uh, her Islamic neighbors. And, again, we're not talking about a person that has any prejudice at all. She's a dear person, very loving, very compassionate, very generous. But these are real issues she's living with now because she lives here in Twin Falls. And in addressing these issues, her safety is being compromised. Uh, and trying to get help for her is a difficulty when your elected officials and the money coming into people's pockets is very influenced. Exactly. Well, we in Texas, we have received so far this year, just since October, since the beginning of the fiscal year, 3,514 refugees uh, here in the state of Texas. And and we are on track nationwide to see the highest number for at least this time in the fiscal year than in any of the previous 10 fiscal years. So the pipeline, yes, as Lance pointed out, they have made some attempts to freeze the program. And, and those, the justices, the, the uh, federal courts out in Ninth District Court, out in California and the West have uh, squelched some of those as well as some others. So we hope and pray that we can get a handle on this issue because cities like yours and Amarillo and many others are being overrun with a relationship between businesses and government officials at the federal level and the state level in providing them cheap labor. And you heard it here of how they're subsidized those first few months, and then, as you said, once that stops, it's time to get in. And what kind of business wouldn't like to get half of their salary covered by the government so you can keep your costs down? And and he is nearly a billionaire now. Now, Julie, we've got a few more minutes left. What are some of the other things that you've found out, uh, any other things that your list, the listeners may be interested in? And how? And because, again, what you're talking about, is probably happening in many other communities around the country. How do people take upon themselves to become a Julie DeWolf here in San Antonio? I would encourage anybody who considers themselves to be a Christian to basically put their money where their mouth is. We are told quite clearly from the Scripture that faith without works is dead. And it is the duty of a Christian to defend those who have no voice. So when you are met with this type of issue, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And to point it out, the, the folks that were born here and grew up here are my neighbors. People on the other side of the globe are not yet my neighbors. So if that fulfills the law, love God, love your neighbor as yourself, I need to start loving my neighbor first. There's no point in bringing in new neighbors till I'm loving the one that's here. And when you see a little tiny five-year-old suffering a rape, and that that being addressed causes such angst and division in the community, we have a problem. We have a problem as a country. What it should have done is rally everyone to her cause. It doesn't matter who the rapist is. She's the victim. And we need to address it as such. What we need is people to have less fear and, and greater boldness in their faith. Step up and defend the victim. Defend the innocent. 
whoever it is, whether it ends up being a refugee at some point, and in, in many cases it, it is refugees that are victimized. I see that locally here, as you mentioned earlier, Roy. Right. Well, we, uh, but, you, you're so so right. Faith without works, uh, you you have to put those things into action, and, and we with G416 believe that we're doing that. We're working with our Truth in Textbooks project, still uh, nationwide. We'll be starting here in just a few weeks uh, in California and other places. Uh, we're making that effort. We hope you'll come out to see Phil Haney, who will be speaking on May the 15th here in San Antonio. Uh, he will be speaking at 6 p.m. on his book, See Something, Say Nothing, uh, as a Department of Homeland Security uh, founding member and as a whistleblower, he exposes a lot of the corruption, a lot of the influence that you talked about earlier, Lance, the Muslim Brotherhood. Those groups at the upper levels of the U.S. government have influenced him. And, and Phil will break that down for us and give us a speech at 6 p.m. at Village Parkway Baptist Church. That's at 3002 Village Parkway. We hope you'll come out and hear this strong Christian, just like Julie DeWolf, who had Phil had the courage, so did Julie, to stand up. And he's been ridiculed. He's been criticized as a hater. And there's no greater Christian brother when you listen to Phil's story. He couldn't have gotten through this without his Christian faith. Julie, that, I think that's probably, you would probably say the same thing. Is that because you've been persecuted uh, because of, of your beliefs? Have you found your faith to be the, the overriding strength behind why you're able to do what you're doing? Absolutely. Julie, I want to thank you so much for you putting yourself on the line, coming on the God Family Country Show the way you have, um, opening up the problem that you're facing up there in your community of Twin Falls, Idaho. Roy, I want to thank you for getting her uh, lined up to come on and share this information. You know, listeners, it's incumbent upon all of us that are Christians to pray for President Donald J. Trump. He has a huge task in front of him. He's being embattled from every direction like no other president in my 70 years of life that I've ever seen or witnessed ever. I've never seen a president be embattled politically from within the way this man has been. We have to remember that one of the most, one of the most important calls upon us as Christians is to understand that we have to continually fight for life. We have to continually fight for the right of life. We have to defend the innocent. We have to defend the unborn. It's up to us to stand up and let D President Trump know, let Congress know and Senate know, <clears throat> excuse me, the rest of the world know that <clears throat> abortion is murder and we're killing our unborn children. We're committing murder at a rate greater than what Stalin ever did, Mao ever did, or, for that matter, even Hitler. Okay, we're killing our unborn so fast, it's hard to even be able to catch up to it. Please excuse my voice. <clears throat> I've had allergies and a bad cold for the last week and a half, but I think you can hear my message. We have to pray continually that abortion is stopped in this country. We are responsible for those things that our nation does. We will be held collectively responsible if we don't stand against it. Omission is the act of commission. Please remember, we're getting ready to come up to the top of the hour right now. Roy White will be back next week. We're trying to get Phil Haney lined up where he can come on and speak with us. And in this next hour, that, that'll be next week with Roy White and uh, Phil Haney, the next hour that's coming up is going to be Larry Brown's coming in with me. And we're going to continue the fight. Thanks, Lance. Thanks for having us, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good day to you. God bless you all. Thank you. We'll be back in about five minutes.